Welcome to the second devlog of my game, The Adventures of Bob. In this episode, I've started working on Bob's world and the gameplay. For everyone who's new to this game, here's a brief introduction. This series is an experiment. Instead of creating an ambitious game that will be finished, or not, in a very distant future, I'm working on a game that is playable from the start. Whenever I stop working on the game, it's a finished product. I'll get back to this idea later in the video and tell how this worked out for me. Here's what the game looked like at the end of the first devlog. Bob has to collect all candy to win. Beware that he doesn't run out of moves. Right now, Bob's world is very basic. It's not very adventurous at all, in spite of the title of this series. Let's make Bob's world more interesting. First I've made the map bigger so that it can hold more stuff. For now you can scroll the map with the arrow keys. Then I've made this arch. I had to update my code a bit, now you can walk underneath it. I don't know what an arch is doing in Bob's world, but there are three in Paris and Paris is pretty interesting. The next structure is the humble house. Here you can see me working on some roof tiles. And here's the house. And here's a bigger house. Apparently wealth is not distributed equally in Bob's world. Working on the tiles took me quite some time. I'm not experienced with isometric graphics, so progress was slow. I watched some videos here on YouTube. One in particular by the amazing Adam C. Eunice made me rethink the shape of my tiles. His shape was symmetrical and when you place them on a grid, they still have a single outline. Now my tile is 32 by 32 pixels instead of the weird 31 by 30 that I had before. Future me is probably going to be thankful for this adjustment. Here I'm working on a brick wall. With this technique you can draw a tile as you would normally do and then transform it into isometric. This one I probably could have made without it, but I think this technique will come in handy with more difficult tiles. I've imported the new tiles and instantly hated it. Way too much contrast. Let's edit that. Much better. Now a basic tile has three shades, so I don't need a vertical line anymore. I like the brick wall, but I think it's more suited for a castle. Here's an upgraded look for the houses. I'm not very happy with them. It looks a bit like someone with a bad haircut. But I'll leave it for now. Time to move on to the gameplay. Once you've solved the best route to collect all the candy, which will take most likely not more than 20 seconds, the game will be uninteresting. It has zero replayability. It needs randomness. There are two things I can change. Place the candy randomly on the map and move the buildings around. I wanted to make sure that candy isn't placed behind the building where you can't see it. Internally I've made a map which is called Obscured. It marks all the positions where you can't see. I've spent some time making a debugger. It shows the obscured map, red is the building and yellow the obscure tiles. If you're making games, I can highly recommend this. Initially it takes more time, but in the end it saves a lot of time and frustration when you're tracking down bugs. As you can see the building is placed at a different position each time you refresh the game. Let's place the three structures. Now I need an extra map to keep track of the buildings. I don't want them to overlap and also I want some space between them. Dark blue is the building and light blue is the not built area surrounding it. As long as I don't place the building on the light blue tiles it should be fine. The new version is almost done for now. Since the candy is placed randomly on the map I should adjust the moves count. Sometimes 50 is way too many and sometimes it's not enough. I have to calculate the shortest route and add a couple of moves. This gave me some headaches. Apparently a honeybee can find the most optimal route between flowers instantly. That must mean I'm more stupider than a bee. Right now I calculate the route by going to the nearest candy and move on to the next nearest one. Fortunately I could use the pathfinding I've made for Bob's movement. I don't know if this always gets the most optimal route, but at least it won't give you too few moves. Let's talk about how the experiment is going so far. Let's start with the drawbacks. One drawback is that I have no idea where the game is heading. Is this going to be a fun game? It's still very basic. And maybe I'll run into problems later since I haven't planned ahead. Another problem is that inevitably I will make stuff that will be deleted later. But maybe this is like building in real life. You need scaffolding that you take down when the house is finished. Here's a major benefit. 
I didn't feel any pressure while working on the game. The list of things that I wanted to do was small. I could take my time to get things right. I've experimented a lot with the artwork. I've made a useful debugger. It felt much better than when I'm working on a big project and ticking off an endless to-do list. The next benefit was unexpected. I think it helped me write cleaner code. The condition of this experiment is that I can never break the game. Of course this isn't meant to be literal. The moment you add one letter to the code, it's broken. What I want is to have the downtime of the game as short as possible. That resulted in me preparing the code for a big change, to make it go as smooth as possible. For example, when I changed the tile format, I went through all the code and made sure that it was ready for the new tile set. Then I only had to import the tiles and change two constants. I noticed this pattern a couple of times during development. I think the biggest test of this experiment will be the next version of the game. Will I be able to make this basic game into something more interesting? I hope so, because I've become really attached to Bob and I hope that he will live a long and exciting life. Thanks for watching and hopefully till the next episode.